What's up, coaches? This is the Football Coaching Podcast. I am Daniel Chamberlain, co-host here with Joe Daniel, as always. What's up, coach? It's another fantastic day, Joe. I have spent the entire day working on spring install, uh, finalizing playbook stuff. Um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I'd say a, a day. It's probably like a week. Um, just trying to figure out what pieces of the system are coming down this year. What aren't? I'm sure we're going to talk about that because we're going to discuss a whole bunch of um, things we're doing to make ourselves better coaches this year. Sure. But, but those um, trying to using your containers, trying to figure out what players need in each section of this off season, uh, offensively or defensively, has been, I guess, a challenge because I don't really know. Um, may have a new job waiting for board approval and I haven't got to meet the kids. So I don't know what, I don't even know what they can handle, right? I don't know what right. they ran last year. I don't know what I'm comparing it to, you know, last year you ran this and now we just call it this or whatever. So, um, it's been pretty neat to, to try to piece it out and then go into like, what can I install? What do, can I remember, um, to tell them, you know, getting very specific and in the, the weeds in spring. So, it's been fun just itemizing it, putting it in like, you know, using those containers, spring ball, some, uh, you know, everybody's doing seven on seven now. So that's changed the game. Now you have to have your pass game in, I guess, really before your run game, like, <laughs> which is not the way you want it in high school. I should say if you're, you know, going to a new school as a coordinator or something, if not, you're just yeah. rerunning last year's stuff. But we've, I mean, skill wise, they've always, you know, had more focus. We don't have spring ball here, so. Um, you know, we're allowed to, you know, we do seven on seven. We do, we're in the weight room. Um, yesterday was my first day of speed install, um, which was fun because I haven't actually run the speed program for a long time. Right. Uh, I tried to hand it off when I was a head coach with, you know, at the time we didn't have access to Dale the way that we do now. Um, I did have an assistant who had been there when Dale installed, but I don't think that he was there thinking I'm going to be running this one day. It was more like he was there, you know, seeing it, he believed in it, but so, uh, and then we've been running it, you know, my head coach has been running it kind of off memory for a while. Um, because even the last time that, that Dale was out was probably 20 it was when i was at amelia so it was 2016 2017 somewhere in there um so you know we, we get to three four five six seven eight years later it's like not all the detail is there we've still got the workouts and everything but now that we have the installs and now that we have seen um dale and, uh, you know, see, you know, have the videos and we talk to Dale and, and I've got all these, I, you know, all the stuff from Dale that we have at athletic speed and movement, um, doing the install, being able to be more detailed, uh, seeing some kids get it, seeing some kids not, we tried to do some film for the lateral series, which is something that we're going to introduce in one of our master classes. Uh, and we ain't there, you know, I was just like <laughs> trying to do it. It's like, holy cow. Like, and I've seen it done, you know, we've done it at other schools. But after the twelve week program, like I said, the day was day one. Yesterday was day one, so I just tr just trying to get some film to work off of, and, and I grabbed some kids who've, you know, they they some of them went through at least part of the program. They unfortunately weren't our most, uh, not all of them were our most committed kids last year. So I don't know how much of it they got. Um, their commitment level has increased dramatically. So can't wait to see what happens with them through twelve weeks this year. But. Um, it's fun getting out there and, and running Dale's stuff and, and just seeing all of the things that we talk about and, and the detail and working on the line, the sink, the strike, the kids picking up pretty quickly, you know, some kids faster than others, but uh, you know, it, it's, it, that's, that's probably the most interesting thing that we're doing right now, but we do have seven on seven. Uh, I think the next phase with our speed training uh, which is, I think, where uh, any coaches that are running athletic speed and movement or want to run athletic speed and movement, the next phase is getting our coaches who aren't, because one of the things that Dale talks about in, in athletic speed and movement is 
one coach runs the speed program, just like one coach coaches the defensive line, one coach, you know, coaches the quarterback. You don't need 18 guys yelling at him. Um, you want one coach saying the same thing in the speed training, but that detaches everybody else from the speed training. They're there, but they're not directly coaching it. Right. So it detaches them from it. And so now I need to get those coaches getting the speed training to transfer into the drills. Um, and, and just with little reminder, you know, knowing those little reminders, Hey, you know, check your L's. Um, that's probably the biggest one is because then they immediately go to over start run receiver drills with their arms, just fly all, fly all over the parade, over the place. Um, like I said, it does imprint, um, but it will imprint faster if they're thinking about these things when they go to, um, and, and, you know, honestly, I didn't say anything about it. I didn't, I, I literally had to go in. I had very little time. I had to go in, run the speed stuff and then leave. Um, and as I was leaving, they were going into some individual stuff, getting ready for seven on seven. And I'm like, I didn't even think about it at the time because I was thinking they'd be going to the weight room and they did after that. But, um, what I'll do on Wednesday when I go down there is, uh, when I go to, to implement day two is remind them you need to be doing this on your, so I didn't even say anything to the kids. Um, but yeah, we're doing, so we went seven on seven, uh, and I'll be starting hopefully in the next week or two, we're going to use alignment progression kind of similar. Uh, and, and then I'll be, I'll see how that goes and eventually probably share it with our JDFB, uh, clients in some way. Um, cause I want to get our linemen, you know, one of the things we want to do is get these linemen ready to go much yeah. sooner. And the way that we've all, where this started was the way that we've always handled things is once established who are linemen and who are not, um, you know, the skill guys are working on seven on seven, our linemen would not be working on pass pro very much, right? They would be working on installing run game because the skill guys will figure it out. Um, and, you know, we might not have the H's and the Y's as much, but the linemen be working on. So this year, because of being in a small school, um, you know, our linemen are throwers, they're baseball players, they're, um, you know, they're everything else. Uh, at a small school and I may only have, you know, we've got, we have 40 kids out, uh, right now, which it workouts, which is incredible at a yeah, school this size. with all the other sports um, still in session, right. With all the other sports in session. And, um, so our numbers are great. A lot of them younger guys. Uh, so, you know, we'll be working with a few linemen that are going to be playing varsity, a few that will be playing JV and a few that will be playing middle school. Um, but. Uh, so we'll be working a lot. We'll we'll be working more in this twelve week progression, more individual um, skill work, um, teaching you know teaching kids things like well, first of all, just getting into a stance. So going through our ASCA, you know, stance, um, teaching them. We can teach them things like alignment. You know, what's a especially with the young guys. What does an eighteen inch split look like? What is a normal alignment? What is a heavy alignment? What is a um, you know when we're if we're down the goal line, we want to pound it in, you know, getting up, getting up tighter, getting into a four point stance and going in a wedge block. Um, yeah. when we're past setting, we can loosen up a little bit more, uh, and, and set back a little bit further. Um, or if I need to down block and I got to cut a quick guy off, I want to be set back a little bit more so I can get across to him. Um, not done work for the center, but everybody else getting them snapping, getting them down blocking is going to be a big one. I want that to just become such a natural, you know, movement. Um, but we can start, and then we can start to build our other blocks, our base blocks, our combo blocks, getting into position. So that is what we're doing right now with this time. But our linemen will probably be working more on, our linemen will be working more on the linemen's run blocking stuff. They'll do so some I, footwork too. I have to ask, you said you do an individual progression for your linemen. I know Dale originally created the athletic speed movement program to have an individual progression for mm -hmm. every runner. Are mm -hmm. you taking this opportunity to kind of use that or is everybody still on one, one, are you just day one, day two? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be day one, day two. Like, okay. you know, we just, uh, we, we, there's no way to, but it'll be similar to that, you know, two days a week, um, similar type of two days a week, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we'll try to keep it around 15 minutes, um, of indie work. Sweet. But progressing from, you know, day one being a lot of stance first step. Uh, and then progressing into the different types of blocks that we need to do uh, and, and working them that way. 
the footwork awesome. it's because the the good thing about the way that we teach offensive linemen i get coaches all the time in our in our kickoff registrations new coaches to jdfb asking about more aggressive linemen well if you're going to kill them on board i mean we could go on a sled you know i guess but i, I don't i don't find that valuable it's not it doesn't translate to the game it just doesn't you can tell me you can say whatever you want and and if you want to do the sled for conditioning that's great but that sled has nothing to do with what they're doing in a football game right other than maybe the way you contact it if you contact it with a good surface you know with a strike and all that sort of stuff but you know the hip roll so if you're going to if you're going to strike it roll it and let it go that's fine um, or get it up and chop your feet. I can see that, but driving that sled down the field is just a waste of time. Um, it, it's like almost like the ladders, right? Where you're building bad habits. It's kind of the right same thing because they, the sled, they right because they get the little bitty choppy steps, or they're like, oh, we got to do 25 yards. But we're going to get these giant right. overbounding, and then they're spinning it and they're trying to match pace with someone else. It just well, yeah, because what what happens is okay, you know, hey, right side, you know, the right side's moving is is spinning around on the sled, and so the left side can't use choppy steps because they're gonna, you know, that looks bad, and right. so then you end up with these long driving steps. So if it depends on what you ask for, but yeah, if you're if you're doing it for distance, like yeah, you're gonna just wear them. It's it's a conditioning thing. It's fine if you want it to be conditioning. I would never use it in season that way. Um, I don't like using it at all. I don't like using shoots. I don't like using boards. Um, but a lot of guys think, you know, what we have to do. And I used to do all this. It's in the offensive line system. We used to get on boards and everything and and just kill it on board, block on boards, block on boards, block on boards. And, you know, that's that's what we did. That's what I did 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and I, even my first year at Amelia, I think we were still using boards, which was 2016. Um and I just got away from it. I got away from it twenty by twenty seventeen by twenty eighteen. Wasn't using any of that. We're bird walking, uh, and our offensive line has been consistently, you know, so much better than it was before that. Uh, and so we can do all of this work, and we can get better right now, um, as opposed to we got to work on being aggressive. You know, block on boards, and it's like I used to. I used to think like, especially with defensive line, I used to think defensive line was just a waste of time if we were in helmets or something or, or you know in the off season it's like we can't do anything uh i don't know if you've ever seen a crowther sled the the in so a crowther sled is um an inside it's a, it's a piece of weight room equipment it's kind of like an attacker or whatever you want to call it different different things a crowther sled is kind of an inside sled um that you could get on and drive. And I used to think like, if we don't have one of those or, you know, all these different things, like we can't get it that you had, you know, I always thought you had to have that to get work done in the winter. Right. And uh, in some places and in Virginia, like that's touch and go, you know, some days, but, um, I, I, I would have zero use for it now. It would just be the most, the biggest albatross in the weight room. Um, so I, I think we found a way to get more out of our guys. And we found a way to work tackling. We found a way to work, you know, all these things without pads, without worrying about it. Yeah, we have, you know, we do have spring ball in Oklahoma, which coaches get to choose. So you can, if you do spring ball, you get 10 days or whatever. Um, full pads, even. Like, right. it, you, you get lots of good work, uh, but you give up a team camp in the fall. So, but what we're seeing now is a lot, so a lot of people went away from spring ball because like, no, I want my two team camps. I want to make sure that I'm good then because I don't have my freshmen yet. Those eighth graders can't come out because it's still their eighth grade year. So they can't come do varsity sports. Um, and so a lot of people went to the two team camps, but now we are more and more people are playing week zero. Mm -hmm. They have a week zero game. Well, if you do that, you have to give up a team camp because that's a team yeah. camp week. So by the calendar, you can't go to two team camps if you play a week zero. So now we're going back to, we're seeing a transition back to spring ball. So um, it's just kind of how people, where they're wanting to get that bye week. Do you want it in the spring? Do you want it for one team camp in the fall? Or do you want it, you know, a lot of people are putting it, of course, after their their last non-district game. So what yeah. would be week three, um, now that's a bye week, and then they get in their district play. So um, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty neat. And, you know, that spring ball is what it is. Some people choose to do it. Some, some don't. 
lots of uh, pros and cons for both, I suppose. We don't have a team camps or anything like that. So, um, y'all do what do y'all, y'all call them? There's some weird jamboree, right? Don't y'all go to jamborees? Uh, like a, a is that what a team camp is? A jamboree is just a scrimmage with multiple teams. Yeah, that's what team camp is for oh. us. Yeah. Oh, is that the thing where you got all the guys standing on the field in your film? Yes. What are all those guys doing there? Yes. Yeah, we don't do that. I mean, we do a jamboree. We do have jamborees sometimes, um, but it's just you know you're you're doing a quarter with this team and a quarter with this team. Yeah. Um, or however we set it up. So yeah, yeah we do some of that. Uh, I think this year we're going to do a couple scrim. I know we're going to have a couple teams at one of our scrimmages. We usually have a couple different, usually like three teams. Sometimes we'll just have a one-on-one scrimmage. It just depends on scheduling. Um, right. It depends on who can be there, distances traveled. Scrimmages are tough to to get scheduled, especially because you've got you know the window. We don't like to start practice before August first. Um, I I flat out told my head coach, and again, I work for a friend of mine who I know has is like minded. So right. I'm not saying I'm not telling everybody else to do this, uh, but I do this. Um, I'm not coming if you practice before August first. <laughs> uh, I can say that because I know he doesn't want to practice before August first. And if we had to, because of number of days to first scrimmage and all that sort of stuff, then I would, I would do it, but yeah. uh, I prefer not to. And I think we, you know, we, we put thought into scheduling those scrimmages. And so we're actually doing the same thing that I did when I was head coach, which is because we're short on time to get ready for first scrimmage, we will have one Saturday practice and it'll be that first Saturday because we need a number of days in helmets, number of days, you know, three days in helmets, two days in shoulder pads before we can go full pads. Um, right. And I actually had our first full pads day. Now I had a very experienced football team, but their first full pads day was a scrimmage. Um, now that was the team that we started five freshmen, five sophomores and a junior. And then, so by the time that we did that, they had all been starting for three years. This was their, right. so they, they were not at all concerned about it. And it was a, an entire team of those kids. Like there weren't, Everybody on that team had been involved, had been playing for years. Um, I wouldn't do that. Wouldn't do that with a young team at all. Um, but yeah, we so we'll get out there. We're we're doing a zero week this year, which is great because that's the only way we get a bye week. Um, yeah. So we flip flip some flip some teams around. So we will get a bye week this year, thankfully. That's good. Well, um, obviously. If you're listening, you could tell by the title that we're talking about our new level up section of the podcast tonight, and we're just going to kind of lay out what our what, what Joe and I are doing during that level up, how we're becoming better coaches this off season, um, and this will be something we'll talk about every episode. It's how we're going to start all the episodes. It's just what we're doing today to uh, to be better football coaches. So we want to tell you all about that. What it and, means, and, to us. and what I wanted to share is for coaches. I'm going to share some different books and things that have helped me. Um, and I'm sure you'll do the same that, you know, maybe I'm not looking at them right now, but we're all looking for ideas, right? You know, how do I level up? So this is really about how you as a coach listening to this podcast can, you know, ways that you can level up as a coach right now, um, yep. going into things that have helped us in the past get there. For sure. Um, before we get started, do you want to pay the bills here, sir? Yeah. Uh, check out joedanielfootball.com slash rules. And we have 40 coach, 40 coach, simple rules for football coaches who want to win more games. You can get access to that PDF document. I've basically gone through, uh, lessons learned from working with thousands, over 9,000 football programs in the last, uh, 14 years here at JDFB going on 15 years at JDFB. Um, and lessons that I've learned that have been consistent throughout, uh, and some of those lessons are going to help you win more football games this year if you apply them. Things like non-negotiables that you must demand from your players, uh, the whole coach simple philosophy, levers, ASCA, how all of those things work within your program, how you incorporate them into your program. Uh, so there's lots of good stuff there. If you apply some of it, you're going to find that's going to be a great benefit to you. Go to joedanielfootball.com slash rules. That is free. It costs nothing. It's all free. Sweet. So we'll just jump right in here. Um and we kind of described it already, but what is the level up thing? What is, what's the big idea there? So I stole it from a nerd podcast. Um, and we just, we tried to come up with like another name, but it was like, eh, you know, this is a really good name. And I'm sure there's some other play, podcasts use it or other places use it. Um, I have a nerd podcast that I listen to called 
uh, I don't even know what the name of it is, actually. It is a classic. I'm going to look it up, though. It is a classic RPG uh, video game podcast. Uh, and it's called Square Roots. For those of you who don't know, it's because of the company Square. Square Enix right. uh, does most a lot of the, the RPGs that are on there. Uh, the Square Root podcast does uh, plays nerd, you know, 40, 50, 80 hour RPGs. So some of them will be like 10 part episodes where they do walkthroughs of the, but they start with of the, of the game, but they start with a level up, obviously the, the video game um, and just talk about things that they've done or, or, you know, a book that they read or a movie that they watched or a TV show that they've been watching or something they did that leveled them up this, this week. Uh, and so I wanted to steal that because we open the podcast a lot of times kind of talking about the weather. And quite frankly, you know, if you don't listen to these podcasts right when it comes out, actually, even if you listen to it right when it comes out, we record a little bit ahead of time. So it means absolutely nothing to you, especially if you don't live in Virginia or Oklahoma. So right. we, you know, talked about making that opening of the podcast a more valuable um, time. So, you know, we want to have a time where we can kind of talk about what's been going on. You know, Daniel and I uh, only see each other generally once a week. So, you know, we have that time uh, and, and we, but we need a little structure to it. So that's the, that's the purpose of the level up structure is that we want to be able to talk about what's going on with us, but also give you something to maybe help you level up as well. So you might find a book, you might find a TV show, you might find a movie, uh, you might find a an event of some sort that you can also use to level up. Perfect. Uh, since you described it so well, I won't waste any time there. I'm going to jump onto the second part, which is um, kind of what are we doing right now? And so because your list is cooler than mine, I'm going to steal the thunder here and go first. Um, I have, I found myself in that really neat part of being a football coach to where and, and my, my time is different than everyone. My journey is different than yours. It's different than everyone that's listening. Because in year 1.5, I started teaching football in the football coaching podcast. And so um, I've talked a lot about JDFB football and how that was an accelerant, right? Uh, uh, just absolutely took my coaching knowledge, my football knowledge from square one to 10 so fast. And... And so what I've found is I like have to challenge myself to go out and get outside the JDFB box so that I don't just know one system, right? I understand concepts now, um, your containers, um, however you want to mention that, right? I, I know what power is. I know what counter is. So now I got to go look at like, how are other people doing that so that I can just keep fresh ideas coming in so I don't get stagnant in my career. Um, and so football wise, I, I got that, you know, hugely accelerated career. And so now I'm like, I think I'm ready to be a head coach. So I've done a lot of applying for those and interviewing for those jobs this year, interviewed for three of them, and then had an email conversation with the fourth that did not interview me and, and kind of, um, I like to just reach out to people and say, what did I do wrong? Why didn't I either get the job or get the interview? And so that was the first place I started my leveling up this year was applying for the big seat planning that packet. So putting it, so I stole your stuff, right? Your stuff that's on JDFB from Amelia, I believe it was. Um, I took from other coaches in my area. Coach Collins gave me his packet. Um, I bought a, a couple different resources. Uh, the Parker Resources book is one of them. I've not got to read into it very much. I did listen to their podcast. Parker Resources podcast has a head coach, like 10 episode section and then they did a leadership one as well which they looked at leadership different than i would have and that's great because i i learned some more stuff obviously my leadership is military based and right. so i'm thinking about small team management and conducting things but uh the very first thing i did to level up this year was the head coach blueprint by chris four who we had on the podcast i don't i think that'll focus on that i hope yeah I so. um so if you're watching you can see the the book but if not just just google chris four um f o r e and his head coach blueprint. And that is a book that I took his stuff and compared it to yours. I compared it to Kenny's. Um, and then, you know, coach Collins, all those guys that have put into my career. Uh, and I compared like, what does it look like? And what I found is we're all saying the same thing. We're just doing it in different ways, but it was good because 
you know, he helps with like resume. Like mm-hmm. I this year started with a very professional black and white resume. Um, the same thing that you would give to a fortune 500 company. That's what I turned in. And then I read his book and it was like, Nope. And he came on the podcast too, right? He talked about it there and you know, we've got to have color. We need images. Your packet should probably be a PowerPoint. Um, I didn't initially take his advice of shortening it up. I still went full system with it because I needed to know what my system was. Uh, but I did end up shortening it down and making a, here's all the important things. If you want to know more, hire me and I'll, I'll tell you what my system's about. Right. Um, so that was my very first thing is I got into his, his book and compared it to everything else I had in, in my head coaching plan. And what I found there is it just made me better about understanding what my philosophy is. Can I put into words, right? Your coach, simple, play fast, win. I've bounced around with a bunch of different ones. You know, relationships over everything is huge to me. I'm, I'm big on relationships. Um, integrity and adaptability are two very, very big things for me. So, you know, I want to make sure we're adaptable. We can mold the whatever, whatever the situation. I'm teaching my kids adaptability. Our PT clinic is called adaptable physical therapy. Like we, that is a word we believe in in our household. So, uh, figure out how to tie that back to football, not only in X's and O's, because obviously you don't know what defense you're going to get. You don't know what offense you're going to see. You got to be adaptable, right? Your system better be able to handle all that stuff. But also as a head coach, what do you do if, um, you know, uh, Tyrell Shelley's a, a good friend of mine. I've kind of taken him under my wing, and, and that's been something I've, I've been teaching him ball. But he had a, a player that basically tried to get in a fist fight with him in the middle of a game this year, right? And so what do you do? <laughs> you're the... You're the guy signaling for the DC because he's in the box. And now all of a sudden the linebackers bloodied your nose by hitting like headbutting you with a helmet in a fight. Like you better be adaptable. You better figure that out. Right. Have a philosophy. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was big for me. Um, another thing I went into is I, I didn't obviously didn't get a head coaching job. So I started looking out for coordinator jobs and I wanted to be a better DC. And, and I feel like I'm still learning the JDFB defenses. So, have, I'm a four two five guy. I love it. It's simple, but I understand the need for a little bit more complexity. And the three four brings that. Plus, last year I got told you will run the three four, right? Um, so I needed to know more about that. And so I, I continue going through once again JDFB. If you're not a member, you should be. Um, it's it will accelerate your coaching career, and you'll be able to pass that on to your players. So I'm going to pitch that ten more times because my level up is huge on Joe's stuff. But I thought, where is something that I'm not taking out of JDFB? And that was film breakdown. Not how to watch film or what I'm looking for, but literally show me the winning formula for columns and huddle. What am I writing in there? What I want generic blanket names for formations, right? So that I can always come back to it. Um, And it doesn't matter what OC I'm in the room with. I'm going to have a thing I call formations. And so I tried to do that a couple of years ago and it just kept getting convoluted by what each head coach called or OC called that formation. So I went out and bought uh, Cody Alexander's Breaking Down Your Offensive Opponent. Um, This book, if you've never read it, you can take any film from that point forward. And I found that uh, I think I broke down eight games, two different opponents, four games apiece, because he talks about, you know, they're two most recent and two similar to your, what you're going to uh, be running. And I could tell you about 90% of the time what play was coming out of the offense when they lined up in a certain formation. So the way he teaches it, the way he teaches you route concepts and like let you give a name to them, right? What is um, Y cross? You know, Y cross is something I've been getting big into with with, uh, passing concepts. But what is that? And how do I know it when I see it on film? So that I can just name that and I'm not guessing. I'm not naming every route like an NFL, NFL guy, right? So... Um, super good book if you're a defensive coordinator looking to put things in concrete. This is what we are going to call these, no matter who runs it. Um, and, and then you can teach that to all your coaches. So super short book, uh, inexpensive on Amazon, I think. I got a ton of good good stuff out of that book this year. Um, I'll cover these two books real quick just because I've already spoke about them on the podcast and one of my level up, but Extreme Ownership and The Dichotomy of Leadership. These are both by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Um, these are, I think better for your kids. Once you've read it and understand it and, and, and do it, it's better for your kids than almost anything else you're going to teach them in life. And it's, and by your kids, I mean your players, but you could also take it home and teach your kids. 
it basically just te tells you extreme ownership tells you everything's your fault and it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter, um, what, who did it, what the problem is, what it's connected to, how they're connected to you. It doesn't matter. It's your fault. And it's basically the idea is the quicker you begin tying yourself to everything that happens in your world, you'll start asking the question, what could I have done to stop that from happening? Right. If it was a bad thing. What can I do to improve that in the future? And so it, it basically just makes you a, a problem solver all the time to where you are, instead of retroactively solving these things, you're, you're doing them before they ever happen. Um, however, my wife immediately pointed out that extreme ownership is not super realistic because if you put in a don't drink and drive program at your school, I mean, you could test kids every time they leave your office or your, your locker room. They could be blowing on a breathalyzer and you say, cool, you're not drunk when you're leaving here, but on Friday night or Saturday night, they go to a party and get a DUI, right? So at some point you can't do everything. And that's where the dichotomy of leadership comes in. So it gives you that gray area between not trying at all and trying all the way. And then where do I fit in the middle? And one of my favorite parts of that is like holding people accountable, not holding their hand. Right. So that's just one very small chapter out of that book. But that's that's the one that kind of speaks to me about the entire book, because it, it says, yes, I'm going to tell my kids don't drink and drive high schoolers, but I can't physically go with them all day Saturday and hold their hand and keep a beer or, or a, whatever, a shot out of their hand. All I can do is just coach them up to be the best young men possible and then have some understanding. Right. Be adaptable after that. So um, hold them accountable, make them have a discipline for that. Um, but you can't hold their hand. Outside of that, Joe, um, my last little bit is just, is, is graphics work. Um, I have, you know, I started with Canva really last year and, and I, I did it to kind of help with the podcast, kind of increase my responsibilities here on the show. Uh, that led me to Photoshop because I found Canva was very limited and elementary. But before I go to Photoshop, Canva guys, if you're not using it, number one, it's free for educators. So if you're a school teacher and a coach, or probably as long as you have a school email, you get Canva Pro for free, which is really everything you need. For instance, I created my entire offensive system, a whole playbook. It's 200 probably slides, but um, it's every tag of every play out there. And now I can quit worrying about losing my huddle, <laughs> which happens every time you change jobs, right? And I can just turn this into a PowerPoint, any section of it, and send it to someone. All right, I can download a PowerPoint of just my run plays. I can shoot that off to the run game coordinator or the O-line coach or whatever. Pass pro, same thing. Um, you can also send it to kids that way. So it becomes a digital playbook. Not to mention all the graphics you can make for your team, right? What are you doing for your team to get your players in the limelight, get recruiters coming and talking to them? It kind of helps you do all that. I've made a lot of like game day graphics, final score graphics, uh, you know, playoff bound, um, whatever. So... Canva has been really good to help kind of get that graphics game going and, and schools love that stuff. Kind of a, a quote I heard early was it's super cheesy. It's absolutely cheesy to make these social media post things, but yep. kids love cheesy. Yep. They absolutely love it. Right. Um, kind of the same reason carnival games are so big. It's the dumbest thing. You get this giant bear. You're never going to be able to do anything with it, but it's cheesy and kids love it. So uh, that's been really good. And then that just took me on to Photoshop. And that's my level up there is so that I can create announcements that look a little more professional than Canva, right? I can do gradients. I can do opacities. I can do all this stuff. Um, many of you that follow me on Twitter have seen like the football helmets. The, the That was kind of my first intro was I bought a, a mock-up football helmet. And I just went crazy making all the teams um, in our schedule uh, last year and this year. And just getting really good with that. And then that led me on to like where I'm creating things now, just more from scratch. So, so there you go. My level up this year has been everything from everything that I can do as an assistant coach to support a program, support a head coach. And hopefully I'm turning that into money pretty soon, right? I'm going to, I'm going to try to start making money off graphics. I was obviously getting, you know, promoted as a coach would be wonderful. Um, we'll kind of see where that goes, but uh, all those things are leveling me up to be a better coach, a better asset to my head coach, which I would imagine most people listening are assistant coaches. And that's, I think that's what you need to do. Ask that question and mean it. Don't just ask it because coach Chamberlain said so, but what can I take off your plate? What can I do for you to make your job easier? I asked that question to coach Collins last year and 
I think he thought I was lying until he realized I, I literally wrote the newspaper articles for the team. I kept all the stats. I broke down all the fit. Like I did everything to make his job easier because I understand he has a very complicated job. So yeah, there's my level up, man. Kind of a long winded answer, but you know, I've done a lot this year to just be better at what I do. Yeah. And I actually going back to extreme ownership. I did start that, um, audio book, uh, on the way home this past week from my dad's. So, uh, I've, I've maybe the first, I think I know I've done the first chapter and then, and then the, the military part of chapter two and the lesson, I think just gets getting, and I do absolutely, even though I've only listened to one of the business lessons, it was like, <laughs> this sounds like, it sounds like a guy who wrote a book and was like, I'm going to write this book based on my military experience, but this could be really helpful to somebody in business. So I'm going to make up stories about business. Right. So, and I, I'm listening to it. And I'm thinking, okay, this is an extremely popular book. Go back and get real stories now. <laughs> I, I feel like it's it's one of those privacy issues too, right? He can't. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to say the CEO yeah. of Walmart was yeah. struggling to control his business. Well, People are the, Google CEO of Walmart. The level of detail in the the military stories because they were there, and it's it's two two people. It's Jocko Willick and uh, Leif Babin. Leif Babin, and um, so they were there, and they, and you know they have and and I've. I, I was not in the military, but my dad was. So I know that part of being in the military is learning to tell stories about the things you did in the military. So they're very good at the storytelling <laughs> side of it. Uh, because as far as I know, that's what you do when you're around other soldiers is tell your stories and you hone those stories over time. Um, so, you know, those stories are very detailed and very, and then the business stories are like, like you said, like there's some sort of, uh, NDA that they can't tell too much information about it. I what the first, and I'll just tell this to anybody who's, who, who wants to go and level up with extreme ownership. Um, the, the first hour. So the very first story from Iraq is, is very long. And I don't know about the rest of it. The second story is not as long, but the very first story is very long. And I'm listening to it and I was just thinking, this ain't for me. Um, so in the, the first hour of the book, all I was thinking was, this is not for me. I am not interested in this. Um, it really just, it, it drug on to me. Um, and there was a lot of, and by the way, there is nothing wrong with being very proud of you know, being a Navy SEAL and all, you know, the, the, you should be. However, yeah. listening to somebody being proud of it for an hour is like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. That's enough. Uh, but so the kind of what we talked about last week, the military stories don't appeal to me as much. Although then the second story, which is not about, you know, firefight, but it's about the training where the, with the, the boat crews and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's more like, to me more like I, I can, okay, that's like team stuff and whatever. Um, so, it, but it was shorter also. Um, and it also wasn't directly as directly, you know, those guys. Um, right. It felt more like a story that was real, but was not like, here's what we did and here's how we did it. And it was awesome. Um, and, and I'm not, again, they should be proud of it. They should absolutely. Um, but, after at the end of so the in that initial story is is essentially introducing the concept of extreme ownership yes um and if you listen if you if you hear the phrase extreme ownership you know what that I mean we know where it's going it's probably on the back of the book you know honestly uh it's not like some crazy concept that we've never heard of before um the story was long, but then the introduction of the concept and then going into the business story, even though it was a little bit contrived, it felt like, um, it, by the end of chapter one, I was, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm into it now. I'm, I'm going to continue listening. Um, 
but it, it was rough at first uh, for me. I was like, this is, I, I almost, I almost tapped out. Had I not been on a six and a half, seven hour car ride with a one year old um, and just needing something to distract myself, um, I probably would have tapped out. Uh, I only listened for about an hour and a half. Um, so, but I, I, it is, it is good. Um, and I'm interested to be, so one of the things about extreme ownership, and, and I was always, I was turned off by the, by the just concept of the book. Um, I've never known anything, something about the majority of people who recommended it to me. And I was like, you know, I don't want to read the things that you read, quite frankly. Uh, Sorry. So not, <laughs> but enough people did finally where I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, cause I did, you know, you did recommend it last week and I did start it this week. Um, I also put about 25 other books on my list. Um, and it was recommended by multiple people. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, but so you mentioned your wife saying that it was not, you know, necessarily applicable. And so dichotomy of leadership, my wife, uh, I listened to, uh, a, a, a business thought leader, Grant Cardone. Um, Grant Cardone is, uh, very obnoxious. In fact, he spoke for the NADA convention and my mother-in-law was in charge of, of taking care of Grant Cardone, getting on the stage, uh, getting, you know, getting, getting everything that he needed for that. Um, and she absolutely hates him. Um, she, he's a little short guy and he's a prick. Uh, none of that surprises me at all. And it, it, and like she said that, and I'm like, yeah. I don't care. I'm not trying to be his friend, you know, and I, and I like his books and I like his attitude, but one of the things that he, I like his attitude in the books. It's not my attitude. It's not going to be my attitude, but, uh, you know, and I don't, I, I don't have any interest in some of the things he talks about. He's big on, uh, other people's money type stuff, buying apartments and, and multiplying your income that way. Um, but, but there's also a lot of leadership and work ethic and that kind of stuff. And he has a topic, he has a concept on extreme ownership. That is what he was essentially saying is the same thing. You know, it's accountability is what it comes down to and take being accountable for, and he is in the same vein of extreme ownership and what, what my wife took offense to. And I was like, well, you know, it's, you know, I'm sure if he, if you had a conversation with him, it's like, that's not what I meant. Or maybe he would say it's what he meant. I don't know. Cause he is kind of a prick. Um, he, him talking about, you won't be successful until you take accountability for everything that happens in your life. Uh, and his, you know, if, if you get T-boned in an intersection by a car who ran a red light, you could have left earlier. Right. Right. And, and that idea of there's something I could have done now, maybe you get T-boned by a different car. If you leave earlier, I don't know, but it's the, but that it's that extreme there's always something you could have done. And, and my wife's immediate immediately takes offense to it because she's a type one diabetic. There's nothing she could have done. All that she can do now is manage and do the best possible job she can of managing her type one diabetes, but she's a type one diabetic and there's no, it's not because she, you know, first of all, anybody who doesn't understand type one is juvenile diabetes. It is not because you ate a bunch of sugar. That's type right. two. It's a whole different disease. Um, her pancreas does not produce insulin. Um, so, and she has been, it's been that way since she was 16. So this is where we're at. So, the, you know, and that's like, that's, that's the thing with her was like, immediately was like, I can't do anything about this. Like I can do, I can manage it, but I can't, I couldn't have stopped it. You know? Right. Um, so it's always, it's always the women that come up with all the poke holes in these ideas. And we just want to go out there and, I, th I think it's because Joe, we see maybe because we're football coaches, we th see things as concepts, not rigid, right? Yeah. Like, as soon as I heard extreme ownership, I knew in the back of my head, like, yes, there are things that you can't do anything about. Absolutely. But you can't go through life with the idea that, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff I can't do anything about. And so now everything reflects. There's nothing I can do about that until you're blaming a loss on a player or blaming a loss on the administration or, you know, whatever in, in coaching, obviously there's losing is kind of the big thing. And if you're not saying, yeah, that was me, then you're wrong. <laughs> and, and I think it's incredibly <laughs> valuable. That concept 
is incredibly valuable. It doesn't have to be to some wild extreme. And yes, you know, we could go to the player who gets killed in a drunk driving accident after prom and be like, well, there's not really anything that I could do in the extreme ownership concept. You know, you would say, well, you could have, you know, if we want to go relation, you could have showed up at prom and grabbed that kid and right. thrown him in the back. You could have. Yes. It's not realistic. Right. But there is having that concept of there is always something you could have done yes. in football. We have that and coaches need to have that because kids are kids. And I get way too many coaches who are like, these kids are soft. These kids are slow. These kids are blah, 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 blah. And that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. Right. Yep. That how, what are you going to do about it? My kids are slow. Are you going to get athletic speed and movement or are you going to, be slow yeah, and be mad that your kids' parents made the decision to have coitus with slower people. Right? Like, I think it, uh, I think it teaches you a lot to think outside the box. So just your scenario of prom and a drunk driving accident. Exactly. Why couldn't you pass out $20 gift cards to everybody at prom to get an Uber? Right. Yeah, like, right. There are things you actually can make reality, but you have to get outside the box of, it doesn't mean I have to physically go do everything. Right. I've start creating plans and I got to start creating things that do make sense, that are realistic, that I can problem solve before we have problems. And sometimes it's, you know, just setting down and going against the flow. Um, I think what was that movie? World War Z, right? And they talk about whatever country it was. They had the wall and they were like, well, how did y'all last this long? And it's the, the fifth man or the red man theory or whatever the heck it is, right? And it's when the whole room says, this is okay, be the guy that goes, it's not okay. And figure out why. Find a reason. Punch holes, like you said, even. Right? Women are doing it to us with our extreme ownership theory. Yes. That's always. okay because that bred the dichotomy of leadership, right? Now you know there's another level. I can get over this level. I can find the next piece of the puzzle after I learn these. But And uh, I said, yeah. how could I have avoided this? Well, I could have listened <laughs> to Grant Cardone when she wasn't in the car. And I could have just listened to something that she's not going to be upset about when she is right. in the car there you go. Uh, and now I don't listen to Grant Cardone in the car or if I do I put it in a you know put it in an earbud and listen to it that right. way uh and, and let her have the you know the show tunes on holy crap she listened to show tunes while I was listening to to uh, put the earbud in for extreme ownership or not show tunes, it was something it was something I, I I can't stand um you know so it was just it was better for everybody just get ready for kids bop Joe Kids uh, we we do a little bit about that, yeah, but yeah, it's coming, it's coming down the road. Well, you know, I I want to get to, so I'll just run through, you know, getting back to doing the full. Uh, so I mentioned that a lot of things I've already mentioned. The offensive line program is something I want to put together. The offensive line progression, is something I want to get going this summer uh, or this spring. Um, getting back into Dale's stuff and going out and and applying athletic speed and movement myself even though my teams have used it for years it's usually been somebody else running it um i've always been the weight room guy and so a lot of times with small schools and and uh big numbers in small weight rooms we've needed to rotate and so somebody's doing speed somebody's in the weight room and i'll always be in the weight room um so getting to run the speed program getting to apply that and i'm, I'm looking forward to see where that goes um because you know and nobody will will deny it in the last eight years we haven't done it perfectly uh right and, and now we're i think we're going to do it you know just because of having all of dale's information at our fingertips we're going to do a better job uh so those are two big things for me um the only book that i've gotten you know the only thing that i'm really as far as x's and o's i'm very much into getting back to the, I'm actually going the opposite direction, which is we've done a lot of, and we, and, and all of this stuff is in the system, but over the past few years, we've done a lot of, um, smoke and mirrors. We've done a lot of, all right, we need to read this. We need to do that. We, we, we spread and all this sort of stuff. And I want to get back into under center in pistol, um, what we call 24, 25, you know, power counter. Inside zone, outside zone, truck toss, five run plays. Uh, I want to get back to the core of the offense. I want to get back to uh, hitch seam, 60-61, 60-61 up, which is fade um, for verts. 
Uh, I want to get back to curl, you know, maybe curl our base. Our, I want to get back to our base offense. And I feel like if we just really hammer the base offense, um, getting into the concept that we have talked about, I've been, been teaching and some of our youth, there's a youth programs that really bought into it first, which was get great at one play and then run three or four other plays. So it's the idea of inside run, outside run, off tackle run and count and, and some sort of reverse counter and just get great at one of them. Uh, and now at our level, what we'll need to do is figure out which one that is, because we know that every year it's different. Uh, lately it's been inside zone. It used to always be power. Um, getting back to that base core system and then saying, all right, here, you know, identifying as early as we can, what's, what's the thing we're going to be. Uh, and then focusing in on being great at that and everything else just being good at it, but calling it when is the right time. Um, so that's, I, I want to get back to the basics of the offense. Uh, the only book that I picked up was Capology, which is Dub Maddox. Um, you know, we, I saw Dub at, at the, a clinic in Charlotte and um, very bright, very smart. Um, you know, we talked last week about how confusing he is, but I think if you, uh, you know, he's brilliant. Um, Ron, and, uh, you, me and Ron talked about it, maybe off air. Um, he's much in person, which is why we probably should get talk to him in person. Uh, he is an ex he's excellent at explaining, um, those yeah. concepts, uh, and, and understanding when those concepts, you know, aren't as, uh, rigid as they may sound in a, in a book. Um, so looking forward to getting into some of that, uh, just some of the concepts with that. Um, but we're almost out of time and I want to get to some of the things that I think can level up some of our coaches outside of what we're doing. So I had a list of some of the books that have helped me and some of the things that have helped me over time, uh, that I can get into. And if you want to bring some up as well. Yeah, go ahead, man. Um, in the football vein and books aren't what they used to be. You know, we used to go to, um, you know, there's, there's books, you know, I don't have any of the Cody Alexander stuff. I'm interested in it. Um, we used to go to football clinics and coach's choice would have an entire table of books and we would pick up a book here and a book there. Uh, there used to be lots of books. Uh, and I'll, some of the, I mean, I remember all of the Jerry Campbell books, which were similar to playbooks, but with more detail, they were excellent. Um, I remember I got, you know, and the lines were just spiral bound, like, you know, self self published type stuff. Um, and they're very, very good. We don't get as many books now. And if, and, and if you do, they're a little bit harder to find sometimes. Um, I it's just, it's just not the way that things go around, I think is as much as it used to be. Um, but in the football book sense of things and some of those older books, especially as ones I'll talk about, um, I always, I always defensively go to coaching team defense, Fritz Shermer. Uh, I, I did write the forward for the third edition, but I didn't get anything for it. So don't think that I'm, <laughs> I just happened to, that's how I happened to come across and read it was they were publishing it at, Co I believe coach's choice for the third edition and asked me to write the, the forward for it. And so I read it so that I could write the forward. And it is, if you are any, any sort of beginning coach should, should read it, um, or any sort of defensive coach period should read it. Um, so Fritz Shermer coaching team defense, um, He's been on the podcast, uh, Randy Jackson, coaching uh, uh, Culture Defeat Strategy. It's absolutely excellent. I have not gotten the second book, but uh, Culture Defeat Strategy is excellent. Uh, you know, as far as leadership and that sort of stuff, it's fantastic. Uh, I was kind of looking behind me at some of the books, seeing if I could remember, because uh, a lot of them has been a long time, especially on the football side of things. So I'll, I'll two more, um, two more that are that are X's and O's. The Wing T A to Z is just such a wing T Bible. It's so detailed. And if you want to know just the, the inner workings of an offensive system and the level of detail um, in, in this system, uh, Denny Crean, who's been on the podcast as well many years ago, uh, excellent, excellent, very detailed book, um, Wing T from A to Z. Um, one that I don't know if I've ever mentioned on the podcast is Concept Passing, Teaching the Modern Passing Game by Dan Gonzalez. Fantastic book on just learning passing game, learning, learning like route concepts and the idea, you know, what is a route concept? How, you know, 
understanding. I mean, it's literally understanding passing game. It's it, that's what it is. Um, fantastic. And Dan Gonzalez, um, there's some other books that Dan Gonzalez worked with. Um, um, I'm, I'm going blank. I've gone completely. Uh, Coverdale, Andrew Coverdale. Uh, Coverdale comes in and adds a level of, you know, you think Dub Maddox may be a little tough to understand. Uh, you ain't read Andrew Coverdale's stuff or seen Andrew Coverdale in a clinic. Uh, that's another level of complexity. But again, I wouldn't start with that if you're a new coach. But if you, if you're ready for some stuff, find some Andrew Coverdale stuff. Uh, I'm not recommending that because I, I don't want to blow anybody's mind, but he is very smart. He's ex- incredibly smart. Um, trying to think if there's any complete offensive line, uh, which is Rick Trickett, very good offensive line book. I don't do everything in there by any means, but it's a, and there's also complete linebacking, which is Lou Tepper. I think both very good books. I don't have, I don't have complete linebacking anymore. I think the cover got ripped off and I left it in Amelia or something. Got destroyed. Uh, some of my books have been left from place to place. So I may be forgetting some, uh, but complete linebacking is a very good, uh, linebacker book. Um, those are my football specific books. Those are my football books. Um, and again, there are more, I'm not saying that those are the only ones that you should look at one. That's not exactly, I wouldn't call it like, it's something that anybody could read. It's not just like for coaches, but it's very interesting for coaches to learn about how all of the things in the modern, all the things that we see in football evolved and came about as blood, sweat, and chalk, which is just the stories of where the wishbone came from, how the zone read came to be, all of these different, you know, um, systems and and you know, X's, it just tells the story of how they came to be. And it's a it's a it's a very good book. It's very interesting on the you know, I think maybe even have something I air raid in there with mummy and them. Um, so very good book, but it's not it's not going to teach you the X's and O's of anything. But the, you know, how did it come to be? How did it happen? Um, I think it's a really good one. So those are X and O's books. Um, as far as not necessarily X's and O's, I mentioned Carolina Way. That was the first, and maybe it's one of those, like, that was the first one for me of the of the whole business. Um, and that, you know, Dean Smith is a basketball coach. John Wood's book's also very good. There's there's multiple John Wooden books. I can't remember the one that off the top of my head, but the one. Um, right. John Wooden's books are excellent. Um, Swing Your Sword is you're not going to learn anything like, you know, earth shattering, but it's just a great story of a, you know, a, a great coach. So, um, which is that's Mike Leach for those of you who don't know. Um, I don't think there's any of those other, I love John Gruden book. I don't know if I could recommend it now, you know, but like not, not that I mean, even like, not even because John Gruden's a horrible person or anything like that, but because like, it's, it, I think it may be a little dated. Um, right. and it's not like, again, I, again, it was one of the first ones for me. So I don't know if it's actually a life changing book or anything. Um, but if it's your first one, you know, maybe it is, I think there's better ones than, than that. Um, Urban Meyer's book is good. Again, it's not because or look, just because the people who wrote the book maybe have been tarnished a little bit doesn't make the book bad. Um, above the line, good book. Um, good book to, to, you know, just kind of a leadership book. Um, I think there are any other specific to coaches, uh, specific to uh, like football, because I have another list. I'm not going to leave you guys. You guys are going to, you guys need to go level up. You better do some of this crap. Better go get an audio book. And look, you don't, for those of you who don't know, I didn't buy extreme ownership. Okay. The only reason I've got extreme ownership right now is because I happened to like somebody returned it immediately. So what happened, what you need to do is go to your public library, get a library card. If you don't have one, I don't know what you're doing. I have no, I have no concept. I don't, I don't understand. Go get a library card. Then you can check out books and read them, but you can also download the Libby app and you can get audiobooks through your library. And then you can go to other libraries 
And that way you have like eight libraries to choose from. One of them is going to have it so you don't have to have a 16. Some of them, you know, have a long wait. But, you know, for me, I have the Henrico. I have a Hanover. I have the Chesterfield. I have the Richmond City. You know, some somebody's got the book I want. Usually I got all the local ones. And you can go, you can get library. I mean, you can go get all over the place. Um, go get big libraries. Go get big city libraries. Um, get the Libby app. And then you can not only get the Kindle books, but you can also get the audiobooks and listen to these things when you go for a jog or go to the gym or drive to work. So you need to be doing this. You, those of you who aren't reading any books, you're screwing up, man. You're screwing up. You really are. I just, but just being honest with you, if you're not reading any books, listening to them, at least I listen to most of my books. If you're not doing that, you're screwing up. Usually when I sit down and read a book, a lot of times it's going to be fiction. It's either star Wars or Harry Potter or something nerdy. Um, so that's, um, you know, you make a really good point there and it's, uh, I've kind of been saying it for a long time, but it, it's just, it, it is that practice, what you preach. And when you go to your high school and you're talking to your kids and you're telling them, don't drink and drive, you're telling them, be a good person, hold doors, put carts back, uh, pick up trash as you walk by, right? You're telling them all of these things because you're trying to help them become a better person. Really, it's just building those habits, right? It's just right. when you habitually are a good person, it just becomes that much easier. Yeah, you're just you're just going to find a way to um, do those good deeds, whatever they are, right? And, and then it can start with with anything. But um, if you aren't reading, you aren't doing something to improve yourself. I mean, there's a reason why successful people are always doing that, right? Successful right. people are lifelong learners because things change. Um, you talked about those books that are now outdated. I bet if any of those guys could rewrite one now, it would be different, right? It wouldn't oh, yeah. be the same thing rewritten. No, life, time, everything has changed. Their story is going to change. Their their philosophies are going to change. Um, and, and we're that way in football. We're that way as humans. And I think you know more than leveling up as a coach, you need to you need to be leveling up as a human because you're trying to tell your kids to do that as well, right? There's going to be what, seven to eight teams per state that go home with a state championship every year. I, I don't know how California works. They do weird stuff out there, but each class level gets a state champion, okay? The rest of us didn't just waste a fall and a winter, right? We taught a lot of life lessons along the way, and we helped those kids level up in ways beyond putting a ring on their finger. And if that's all you're in it for, you're not going to produce very much, Um I don't know. Maybe it makes you better because you're heartless and a terrible person. You'll do literally whatever it takes to win, but I don't want that you. ring. That's not me. Right? Anymore. Yeah. So, um, we we kind of went in backwards order. I talked about what I've done, and and you talked about what your future looks like, and then you talked about what you've done the last little bit. So I, we'll close that. I know we're running out of time, but um, kind of where I'm headed the rest of this year. So you know, I've talked about the articles before. I started writing leadership articles, and that's because. I've taught leadership at OCS, uh, Officer Candidate School for the state of Oklahoma for almost five years. Um, won some awards there. Like, I I've done really well. It's my favorite job I've ever had in the military. And unfortunately, that part is going to come to an end. And I'm going to go off and do other things. So while I'm still fresh and I, I wanted to start writing articles or writing something to keep all that, not only pass it on to other people, because I have lessons learned in leadership, but to, uh, to kind of concrete it in for myself. And, and and get a little more out of what the Army is giving me. So um, if you want one of those articles, you can go to the Headsets magazine that Kenny has on his website. That's where they're at. I know Joe's trying to start getting some articles posted to uh, the JDFB um, blog where you find his articles and the websites and event, uh, excuse me, the, the podcast episodes. Eventually I will write for Joe. Um, I just have to get more comfortable. <laughs> um, I want to get into writing books. That's That's what's next for me. And it's because it's so hard. It is so challenging to take this thing that maybe you know enough about it to teach it or not and to decide I'm going to write about that and to go out and do it. And so I want to pick hard topics. I want to pick culture topics. Um, I find it hard. You know, I want to get into the realm of selling football. That's, that's what I want to do. But it's going to be very hard for me probably a decade from now before I sell a single X and O because... Everything I know is you or Kenny, and I'm not mm -hmm. just going to rip y'all off and sell it. And so, you know, I think I'm just going to find my niche is in that 
team building, uh, et cetera. And, and that's where I'm going to try to live. So writing a full leadership book, I think is in my near future. Um, maybe just the story of a soldier who became a, a football coach, right. And kind of the, the strife and the struggles that goes along with being a, a what I consider a good human. Maybe I'm patting myself on the back, but I've, I've chased things in my life to make myself a better human. And man, there's been some hurdles out there. There's been some obstacles from people who maybe aren't quite so good. And sometimes that just gets in your way, right? You just, you got to keep on going. So I want to, I think about just kind of writing that. Um, and just so people can understand you, number one, you need to go out and hire a football coach. There's a website and I'm forgetting it right now. Um, if you're a football coach, I mean, excuse me, a, a, a soldier, listen to this and you want to become a football coach. I use troops to teachers. That was uh, .gov, and that was the, the government thing that turned my four-year degree into a teaching certificate, um, and that way I could coach. There's another one, and I can't. I think it's Soldiers to Sidelines, I think is what it's called, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm trying to get involved with them so I can help other guys kind of do what I did. Uh, kind of a couple books that I want to reread. Start with Why by Simon Sinek, I believe is how you say Simon his Sinek, name. Yeah. That's on my list. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So super, super good book about you can get into and get all the concepts, but the, you know, kind of the big picture there is exactly what the title says to me. And that is why are we doing things? Why are we installing power? Why are we wanting to run this passing concept? Why do we want kids to show up in the summertime? Start with why. And, and I think it is going to help you relate to um, this new generation, which is Oh, uh, it's different, right? It's much different than mine was. It's much different than yours was. And we're, we're completely different generations ourselves. So, um, it is different. And I think we've got to start with that. Why? So that we can teach them to, to not be, unfortunately, where a lot of people are going. Uh, and then the last book I want to mention, uh, leaders eat last. I need to reread it myself. It, it gets very scientific. It gets very into the chemicals in your body that are making you, uh, who you are. It same author, about, by the way. Huh? Same author. Yes. For anybody listening yeah. Simon Sinek. And, um, and, and you know, you won't, you may get through it and go, I still don't know why leaders eat last. Um, but because there's so much to it, but it's going to teach you a lot about yourself and about what it is chemically that makes you, you, um, I guess he kind of describes why leaders eat last, but, sure. yeah. um, you know, it, it is a very good book for, almost that get back to the reason why, why are we the way we are and why do people act the way they do? And I, I just felt like it, it, that helped me a ton and whatever the time that I was listening to it is exactly the book I needed. So, um, anyway, yeah, I think, I think that exhausts my list. Practice what you preach, man. Yep. If you aren't leveling up, you're wrong because you're going to be teaching kids here in about, well, this is coming out at the beginning of April. So if you got spring ball, you're a month and a half away. If you don't have spring ball, you're two months away and seven on seven starts and you're going to be in front of kids. And when you're telling them to get better at a thing, go home and practice and be better at the thing. And you're not going home doing the same thing. Like, yeah. And I think, I think we make a mistake. So sometimes I hear coaches making this mistake of, of, well, you know, and I've probably done it too. Um, you know, it's, I'm in the gym. I go to the gym. I, I work out. Um, you know, you, you run with your players in practice. Those are all well and good. And we can tell our players like, Hey, I, I work out too. I'm going to the gym too. That's not actually helping us be a better football coach. Right. Right. Being in better shape. It's better for us as people, but like, what am I doing? If I'm asking you to put all this work in to be a better football coach, what am I doing myself? I'm asking you to come to the weight room in the off season. What am I doing in the off season? Running the weight room is not making me a better football coach. <laughs> Right. I'm, I'm or I already know how to run a weight room. So what am I doing to, you know, it doesn't, you know, getting stronger, be going to the weight room is not helping me be a better football coach. So what am I doing to, to, to improve that? Um, I'll just run through my, my list. Cause I, I do have to get out of here, uh, very quickly. Um, the other, along the same lines, is, like I said, you mentioned leaders eat last and, um, start with why uh, I think they're very good books. Um, I had both of those on my list. Uh, Grit by Angela Duckworth along the same lines. Uh, Angela Duckworth basically did research on what makes people 
gritty, gritty, what makes people, you know, what we would call, you know, mentally tough, all that. So if you are constantly preaching mental toughness, you should probably know what that means and what grit is and where it comes from. It's a very interesting book by somebody who it is not somebody writing about her life as a gritty person, right? This is research, her experience of talking to people with grit and learning how people get to that point, what makes them tick. Another one along the same lines, if you want to know what makes people tick, if you want to know what makes the best in the world tick, um, Relentless by Tim Green or Tim Greer. Uh, he is the, he, his initial fame came from, you know, maybe really his first client, his first physical uh, uh, training client, coaching client was Michael Jordan. And um, then he's worked with Kobe Bryant. He's worked with LeBron James. He's worked with lots of NBA players, other athletes too, but obviously, you know, he has the in in the NBA. Um, and you want to hear about what makes, what somebody like that is like, um, you know, Michael Jordan winning a championship. And the first thing he says is he wants, I think he said he wants to sleep until six. <laughs> the next day for training, you know, we won't start till six the next day. Um, you want to know what makes one of the most interesting parts of it is you want to know why Michael Jordan wants to gamble $10,000 a hole when he's not that good at golf. You want to know why Kobe Bryant has had, uh, infidelity issues. Um, it's in there and it's, it, it makes sense. Um, so it, fantastic, very, very good um, intense book. Um, but uh, you know, that's another one why, how people tick, um, talk about how people tick. I didn't want to go, like, I didn't know where to go with this, but I always, I always read books. Obviously I run a business. So a lot of my reading is, is based on, um, building a business heavily based on marketing, uh, sales and, um, and lots on leadership and organization building and all that sort of stuff too. And in all of those books, I always find things that I go, I can, you know, this, this applies to football. So a lot of the things that you hear me talk about that are maybe a little bit different, like the containers principle. And I don't, that's not something that I, I didn't get that from a book, but the idea of it being a, a principle um, comes from that. Um, and the idea of designing practices and doing, um, uh, uh, you know, our, our practice plan, 90 minute practice plan, but not really the 90 minutes, but the, the design of the practice, um, the consistency of it, the game film masterclass and how we break down game film and the process we go through and the worksheets and all that, the organization of that, that comes kind of along those lines. Um, but what I always tell people is look, essentially you are, you have got to become, and this is why we talk about what defense is right for you, what offense is right for you. It's the one that you believe in. Because ultimately what you must do is you must sell your system to your players. You must sell your weight room to your players. You must sell your um, you must sell your speed program to your players. We had that fantastic – Dale just did it, just knocked it out of the park. God, you should be in athletic speed and movement, if nothing else. For Dale Basquette explaining how do you get buy-in from your players and Dale Basquette giving – about an eight minute spiel that he gives when he goes to install uh, athletic speed and movement on site. And that eight minutes is worth the entire cost of athletic speed and movement because that's how you get buy-in. Um, but getting that buy-in, which is always the question that I, you know, how do we get buy-in? And I've been telling coaches lately that uh, the, the whole, um, they don't care what you, they don't care uh, what you know until they know that you care. Is, right. is BS. That's wrong. Uh, and what matters is they don't care that you care until they know what you know. If you can't help them win football games, they don't give a crap that you're Mr. Cuddly Bear, right? That That's not how it works. Oh, he's a nice guy. He's just really stupid at football, but he's my favorite coach. How many kids are going to say, how many kids, have, the guys that you look back on, the coaches that we all played for, the teachers that you remember, the coaches that you remember, the leaders that you remember in your life, 
I guarantee you that they were all freaking good at what they did. Yeah. And then they liked, and then you had a good relationship with them. But I don't, my favorite professor wasn't my favorite professor because he let us screw around and gave me an A. I had those professors. I had those teachers. They're not my favorite. They're not the ones that made an impression on me. They're not the ones that, that I would go back to and I bought, fully bought in on. No, the other ones were geniuses at what they did and were great at what they did and were also great, good at relationships. I created a relationship after I figured that out with them. Um, so all of that said, I wanted to give one kind of marketing, but it's not marketing, but to give you start you thinking about these things. It's Robert Cialdini. It's a book called Influence. Um, and basically, again, kind of going through, um, Robert Cialdini goes through, it's a very, very famous book in, in the marketing and business world, uh, going through the things that make people make decisions um, and the, the fact, the, the factors that drive that. Um, and so that's a very good book that you should definitely check out. Uh, if you, if you have interest in getting your players to buy in to the things that you do, um, in, in, so that's a good book. Influence, by the way, uh, you know, we always talk about leadership, 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 leadership is influence. It can be good or it can be bad. Yeah. Right. We always, we always classify leadership as, as, you know, positive, but you know, drug dealers are leaders too. So, uh, and I think that's there anything else on my list. Grit. We've talked. To, oh, uh, one more. This will be my last one. We'll close out because I'm way over time. But I like these things. I, I, I read a lot, and, and a lot of them are helpful to me. Um, and I am in a, a group called Strategic Coach by that, that was started by Dan Sullivan. Um, big big business coaching deal. Um, as I said last week, I was in the wrong room. They're all way ahead of me. But um, a book by Dan Sullivan with Ben Hardy called The Gap in the Gain. Uh, great book for football coaches because essentially the, the concept is the gap in the gain is um, the gap is when we are always looking um, it's measuring forward and measuring backwards. The gain is measuring backwards. It's, it's look at all that we did. Um, and the idea that, and, and I think we, if we're all honest with ourselves, we always have this at the end of the season, right? At the end of the season, we're like, we're all we're thinking about is those games we should have won. And, uh, you know, 2022 at Colonial Heights in our second year, we go six, six and four regular season, losing the first round of the playoffs. So we go six and five, make the playoffs, compete in the second round, in the first round of the playoffs against the number two seed. We're the seven seed against a dominant football team. We compete against them. We had a 28, 20 in the third quarter before we just ran out of bullets, ran out of bodies. And all we're talking about is if if we had played better in that first game, we would have won that. We would have had a higher seed. And the way that we played against the two seed, we were dangerous by the end of the year. We quit, and we would have had a shot to go win the next round, and go on the next round. Same thing this year, six and four, go to the first round of the playoffs, quarterback um, blows his knee on the first play of the game. All we're thinking about is what if that hadn't happened? Uh, what if we had played better against King William and won that game? We played like we did not play well offensively. What if we had won that game? Then we're not we're not at Lake Taylor. We're somewhere else with a better draw. And what if the quarterback doesn't get hurt? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And everybody went in the tank when the quarterback got hurt. What the gap in the game looks at is, you know, being, stopping and looking at things. Um, we do a thing in all of our meetings, and I took this from Strategic Coach. We do it with our staff meetings. Uh, we could probably do it on the podcast. Maybe we should add it. Um, is we do a, um, we do a, uh, I just completely blanked out. I'm going to look the name up because I'm just, I'm a uh, positive focus. So the very first thing we do is at the start of the meeting, uh, when we have staff meetings, JDFP, we have to talk about in, in, in all my strategic coach meetings uh, is, and I do it every week. Uh, I actually do it every day. Um, I have an app where I track it every day. And um, the, every day I put three, you know, put three things that were positive from the day. Every week I put three things, you know, put four or five things from the pre previous week. Uh, and looking back at those and finding the positive in those things. Um, if that sounds goofy to you, then I don't, I can't help you. But um, 
the gap and the gain is a is a really good book for changing your mindset. It's 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 literally supposed to be a mindset mindset shift where you start. All it does is get you thinking about the gap and where you start thinking about uh, the the whole idea behind it is that there's the ideal. We're never going to reach the ideal. That's why it's there. So, and it's fine to chase that ideal. It's fine to set high goals. One of the, one of, one of, one of Dan's things is 10 X, right? 10 X everything. It's a Grant Cardone thing too. So 10 X is not is a very common thing. You know, if, if you sit down and you go, Hey, I want to win, you know, I want to win what's 10 X. So if you sat down and said this year, we want to go 500, 10 Xing that is state champion. Are you going to go from your three and seven to state champion? Probably not. But it's perfectly fine to set that goal and shoot for it. Now, more likely, you'd want to set that in like two years or something, like three years. But, um, but if you set the goal as state champion at three and seven, that's fine. If you go seven and three, be happy. That's great. Find the positive in that, and then you know because you're working towards the ideal, that's fine. But measure backwards. Always measure backwards against what you've done rather than what you think you should have done or think you could do. That's good. Very good concept. Yeah. Sweet. Well, we'll get out of here. I know that we're, we're, uh, you know, we get in a, we could talk for another hour about this yeah. and, and j- some topics don't, don't do that, but this one sure does. Um, so we'll get out of here. We'll pay the bills. Uh, like Joe said at the beginning of the podcast, you can go to joedanielfootball.com backslash rules, uh, get that PDF with 40 coaching rules that just help you simplify football, help you as a coach understand that winning is achievable. It gives you the things that you can follow to make a more successful program. Joe says it better at the beginning, so if you really want to know what all he has to say about it, go back to the beginning of the episode and let's do it again. Um, sales opening or closing? First first week of May, uh, excuse me, of April here. Um, we are, April will be, I believe, Football Coaching 101. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think, but at the end of April, but we, I think we have some other stuff going on in April, but I'm not positive. Um, I know at the end of April, I'll be involved in Football Coaching 101. I'm still ironing out some things for April. Uh, we will have the April newsletter if uh, you know that's going to be coming. Um, we haven't talked about that. That's probably one of my levels up is the newsletter, the the Coach Simple newsletter. Super it's good. Our, I, I loved it. Um, yeah. Thank you. And, and what one of the things you talk about writing when you go and you write eight very small type pages about one of the topics that you talk about all the time, and you just start to dive into it. And um, both of them, I've I've ended up having to squeeze into that eight. Uh, pages rather than having to, you know, fluff to that eight. Right. Um, so that's, that's something that's coming every month. This month is the umbrella principle. So for our clients who are members on April 1st, you'll be getting a newsletter on the umbrella principle coming soon. If you aren't a member, you should be a member and that way you'll get the main newsletter. Perfect. Social media. I'm on Twitter X at coach Chambo. Okay. You can email me at Chamberlain football consulting at gmail.com. Uh, I love all kinds of emails. You want to send me your favorite play or ask a question or whatever, shoot it over. Uh, Joe's on Facebook at Joe Daniel Football. More likely to find him um, by signing up for JDFB Football and going to the uh, chalkboard forums and ask your questions there. If you just want to follow the social media stuff, check him out on YouTube, Joe Daniel Football, or it'll at least get you there when you search it. And he's on Twitter and X at Football Info. Go to Joe Daniel Football on TikTok until it uh, dissolves whenever. Uh, yeah, you know, all the social media so, things. Instagram at, Jordan, Instagram at Joe Daniel Football. Yeah. There you go. The podcast is at the FBCP on Twitter. Um, you know, we're trying to start building things over there. This is your first time listening to Football Coaching Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. You can find us on your favorite podcatcher, Spotify and Apple Podcasts are going to be the biggest two. If you've been listening for a while, please leave a review on one of those two. Um, we're always looking to reach more coaches. We want to help more people, and that all starts with a good review that when someone Googles, uh, football coaching podcast because that's what people Google. Then uh, it'll pop up there and have a good review. If you got a bad review, man, just shoot us an email. Let us know what it is. We finally actually did listen to the you ramble too much about the weather because now look at us, we're leveling up. Yeah. So yes. changes can happen. Just let us know. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football Coaching Podcast. Remember, coach simple, play fast, win. <laughs>